Welcome to this sermon from Silver Lake Baptist Church. Our mission is to celebrate the greatness of God with all we are for the joy, hope, and renewal of our community. We are so glad you have chosen to listen to our message. We pray you will be blessed by your time with us today. So this is just kind of difficult, I think, to read on the screen. At the bottom it says, due to a decrease in cookie sales, the Girl Scouts switched to a more aggressive sales campaign. <laughs> We're all ready to buy Girl Scout cookies now, right? So bad timing on the part of whoever's coordinating the news stuff. But the opposite also happens sometimes. There can be really good timing. And some of you have read those stories of the guy who bought like 10,000 shares of Microsoft when it was a little no-name company, or 100,000 shares of Amazon, and now he's fantastically rich, right? So this last one's related to that, but a little different experience. Go ahead, Aaron. This is the Wall Street Journal magazine. And the advice is how to double your nest egg. In the black there, it says, now's the time to jump into cheap stocks, funds, and real estate. That magazine cover was published on the day of the, the last big stock crash. <laughs> By the time it was widely disseminated, the stock market had crashed 30% from the day they put out that cover. So it's a perfectly normal, fine thing to say, yeah, the stock market's great, go invest in it. But if the timing's off, it can have negative consequences. And today we're going to see Paul giving us some really good life principles about being aware of the time in which you live. So, so remember we're doing this series where we're now in this phase of folks asking the Apostle Paul questions. They've written a letter back to the Apostle Paul. And what we're reading is his response to those questions. So if you have your Bible with you, please turn it to 1 Corinthians chapter 7. 1 Corinthians chapter 7. We're nearing the end of the chapter. We're going to be in verses 25 through 31 today. 1 Corinthians 7, verses 25 through 31. And let's pray as we head there. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you that it stood the test of time historically, that whatever attacks the secular world would throw at your word, they fall apart. Because you have proven your word to be true, reliable, a solid foundation for our lives. So as we read these words this morning, help us to remember that, Lord. Help us to submit ourselves to the authority of your word and to live our lives based on the counsel it provides. We love you and thank you for all that you've given us. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Okay, 1 Corinthians 7.25 says, Now concerning virgins, I have no commandment from the Lord, yet I give judgment as one whom the Lord in his mercy has made trustworthy. We saw a similar construction to this a couple of weeks ago. Remember we decided this, this isn't just like a little B-team version of the Bible. This isn't the junior varsity version of the Bible. This is Paul explaining, I'm not quoting to you directly from the Lord as I was before. I'm not giving you a direct commandment that Jesus gave us in the Sermon on the Mount or at some other point in one of the Gospels. But the Holy Spirit has led me to answer your question in this way. And so that's what he's going to say. I give judgment as one whom the Lord in his mercy has made trustworthy. And we'll see that throughout the letter, Paul's being very careful to establish the authority behind his teaching is not his wisdom, not his popularity, but the word of God coming through him. And it's important because remember, as we started the book of 1 Corinthians, the church has a problem, right? And one of the big problems they have is they're being split up because they're following different leaders based on who they think is the most wise, who they think is the most popular, and he wants to separate them from that. He wants them to see the truth that regardless of the human leader doing the talking, they need to respect the voice of God. And so he says, the Lord in his mercy has made trustworthy. I suppose, therefore, that this is good because of the present distress, that it is good for a man to remain as he is. Are you bound to a wife? Do not seek to be loosed. Are you loosed from a wife? Do not seek a wife. And there is a wide diversity of commentator speculation on what exactly he's talking about here. The thing that makes the most sense to me here is he's talking about engagements. Because remember, it starts out with the now concerning virgins. There probably weren't a lot of virgins who were bound in a marriage commitment aside from those people who were engaged, right? So he's talking about people who are looking at the circumstances around them, taking into account what Paul said about marriage and sexuality, and asking them the question, with all this craziness going on, should I pursue marriage? And for some of us, this is a huge deal prior to the time we're married. I remember as a young man, 
first a really young man, like six or seven, when I first learned to ride a bike with no training wheels, and I kind of experienced that freedom riding around my neighborhood on my bicycle, at some point I asked, do you think there will be bikes in heaven? Because I wasn't sure that I wanted to go to heaven if I wasn't going to be able to ride my bike around and have fun, right? Like I had been with my friends and stuff. But then a few years went, went on and my priorities changed and different things mattered to me. And then I didn't want Jesus to come back until I had gotten married for different reasons. And I, I think maybe some of you have had some similar thought processes going on in your mind. And so these guys, 2,000 years ago, they weren't all that different from us. They're saying, you know, Jesus is going to come back soon. Life's a bit chaotic here. Can we still go ahead and get married? And so this is Paul's response. I suppose, therefore, that this is good because of the present distress, that it is good for a man to remain as he is. Are you bound to a wife? Do not seek to be loosed. Are you loosed from a wife? Do not seek a wife. So don't break off your engagements. If you're getting engaged, if you're going to get married, go ahead and do so. But don't go eagerly seeking this as if it's the number one priority in your life. All right? There's something else going on. What do you think he might be referring to when he says the present distress? We haven't really covered a present distress yet so far in this letter to the church at Corinth. And there are three kind of broad ideas that I think make sense. I don't think we can be dogmatic about any of them other than the third. So the first one was there was a famine in 51 AD that affected a lot of the Roman Empire. And the Christians were disproportionately not given food (laughs) because they were a persecuted class. So some people think he's talking about the fact that these folks were starving and they did not have access to food that the rest of the empire had. And so he's saying, look, if you guys don't have food, it's not a good idea for you to go committing to new mouths to feed, right? If you're a young man and you marry some lady, you're committing to feeding her. And because you're going to get married, you're eventually going to have kids and those kids are going to want to eat too. So maybe it's a good idea to hold off, get this all sorted out. That makes sense to me, but again, I'm not 100% sure that's the present distress he's talking about. The second one is a more general persecution against Christians that we know for sure was taking place right? The leadership was not super fond of Christians and their advocacy for something other than the empire being the God, the sovereign of the universe. And so that caused conflict and they were persecuting Christians. And so by the same token, it it didn't make a lot of sense to go embark on this new relationship when you know you're living in an environment where there's a tag on your head, where people are looking to take you out. Do you really want to expose your new wife and your new family to this hardship of this path you've committed yourself to? Again, makes sense. We know that it's true, but I don't know specifically that's what Paul's writing about. The third one is the imminent return of Jesus Christ and the the last day events accompanying that. Jesus warned in Matthew 24 of all this terrible stuff that's going to happen. If you haven't read it sometime, maybe this afternoon, open your Bible to Matthew 24 and read about all the stuff Jesus says is going to happen. And so the destruction of Jerusalem by the Romans is about to happen Titus would come in 70 AD and destroy the temple and all kinds of bad stuff was going to happen. And so that for sure is one of the things that he's warning the people about. Bad stuff is coming. And so do you really want to embark on this new relationship where you're a follower of Jesus Christ, you're going to be committed to his kingdom in a world that hates you. You're going to be potentially struggling for food. With all these other difficulties, are you ready to commit to a marriage? And so he says, think about it before you do it. In in giving them all these principles on which to base their decision, though, he's also showing us something. And that something that he's showing us is that marriage is not our primary objective. If you're single, marriage should not be your primary objective. And so, as a young man for me, remember, I was hoping that Jesus would delay his return until I could get married. Because there were things that I wanted to experience before my time on earth was done. Was that the most important purpose for my life? Is that the reason Jesus Christ put me here on this planet to live and have whatever period of time he's going to give me here on earth? And as much as some of us might not feel this to be the case, the answer is no. Your primary objective in life is not to get married. And that's a hard concept for some of us because we have this biological imperative that says it is. The, The reason I'm alive is to make a new generation of people like me, right? But really, the reason we're alive is to glorify God. And so even in the midst of your difficulties, your famine, all this stuff, as much as you feel this biological drive to get married, you have a higher call on your life. And that higher call on your life is to let people know about Jesus Christ. 
And he's warned us before that marriage, because of some of the challenges, the demands it places on our time and energy, can have a significant impact on our ability to do ministry. And that's particularly true if we're living in an environment where there's not enough food and where people are locking us up and throwing us in jail, where we're going to be separated from each other. All these things make marriage harder. That being said, look at the next verse, verse 28. But even if you do marry, you have not sinned. And if a virgin marries, she has not sinned. Nevertheless, such will have trouble in the flesh, but I would spare you. So he's saying, even with all these things that kind of speak against the idea of the, the wisdom of getting married right now, you're not sinning if you get married. It's understandable if you get married. It's an okay thing to do. It's a good thing to do. It can be a blessing in your life. But if you do it, you're going to have trouble in the flesh. And Paul's saying, I would spare you from that. I don't want you to see the pain of having your husband thrown into jail where you're at home with your two kids. I don't want you guys to have to experience the pain of seeing your wife taken away from you. And this stuff is happening in the world right now. If we look at the Middle East, there are horrible stories of all the men in a family being killed and the women being taken away as ISIS sex slaves. And that's the kind of thing that could happen and these people could have experienced in, in their time as well. Horrible things happening to someone you're in a committed relationship with is something that Paul didn't want to see these people have to go through. And so he's warning them, times are difficult. But all that being said, it's not a sin. It's okay, it's good, it's a positive thing to get married. The timing just may be difficult for you. And in saying that, he's saying marriage involves difficulty. And we've talked about that a couple weeks ago as well. If I'm married to someone, my time becomes their time. My resources become their resources. My energy becomes their energy. And so he's saying marriage does involve difficulty. Marriage does involve difficulty. And with all this stuff going on, with your call to be effective ministers of the gospel of Jesus Christ, is that the right time for you to get married? Verse 29, he explains a little bit more about why. But this I say, brethren, the time is short, so that from now on, even those who have wives should be as though they had none. What does that mean? You want me to behave as if I don't have a wife so I can just go wild and crazy and do whatever I want to do? Based on the rest of what we read so far, I'm going to say probably not what he's saying here. So what is he saying when he says you should behave as if you didn't have a wife? So that from now on, even those who have wives should be as though they had none. He's warning them that the sand is dripping through the hourglass. Time is running out. And as they're living their lives, they have less and less time to do what it is God has called them to do. And in this case, they're 15 to 20 years from the time the temple is going to be destroyed. The degree of freedom that they have is going to be even more constrained. And so lots and lots of things are going to make their lives very difficult. The time they have left to bear testimony to the gospel of Jesus Christ is shrinking. And this is true for all of us. Every day you get up, that's one less day you have to share the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's one less day you have to impact the world with the gospel. That's one less day you have to glorify God with the one precious life you've been given. And he's saying, look back. This much is already gone. You don't know how many tomorrows are left. The time is short, and it's getting shorter and shorter and shorter. So behave, live, even if you're married, as though you didn't have a wife. And what does he really mean there? That we should consider nothing as our own that we can't hold on to any possession and place our confidence, our hope, our value in life, our meaning in life on that one thing or relationship, right? And, and we see this to be true even now. For people who are obsessed with this one thing, whatever, even a good thing, it becomes an idol for them, and their effectiveness as a minister of the gospel is diminished. Their ability to live a normal, healthy life is diminished. And so he's saying... Don't hold on to your wife, your husband, as the only reason for life. As we said in the first point, marriage is not our primary objective. You have this person to care for, to love, and to respect, but that's not the only reason you're alive. And so he's saying, even if you're married, you're going to be behaving as if you weren't married. And there's another example that you guys can see this taking place right now, and it's not even for God. People are willing to make this sacrifice today. And they're not even doing it for the glory of God. It's for a smaller cause. An important but smaller cause. Has anyone ever served in the military? There's a few of you, and thank you for your service. And when you've done that, if you were ever deployed, you had to behave as if you didn't have a wife for a period of time. 
you had to leave wife and kids at home and go live in the sand for six months or go sail on a ship for three months or whatever it is. You had to live separate from your family for a period of time. And Paul's saying that's the demand that's probably going to be placed on some of you. You're going to be thrown in jail and separated from your wife because you were bold enough to share the gospel of Jesus Christ. You're going to have to go without food and face difficult circumstances like a single young man might if you're going to stand up for the gospel of Jesus Christ. Those are the kinds of sacrifices he's painting a picture of for them that they're going to have to do. Live as if they, their primary concern in life was not caring for their wife, which is a big, hard thing to live with. And people do it. There are other jobs besides the military, but the military, I think, is the most common, clearest example of people living almost as if they were single young men still, even though they have a wife and kids at home that they're trying to support. And it's difficult. Think of the military families and the difficulties they face and the divorce rate and all the difficult things for people who are kind of, in a way, living as if they had no spouse. So marriage does involve difficulty. And with the time shortening, we see a shift in priorities. Right? When there's a war, do you think a man is crazy to go fight for his country and leave his wife at home? I don't. I think it's the right thing to do if it's a just war and we're protecting innocent people or defending the freedom of this country. There need to be men who are willing to stand up for our freedoms and go and fight, even if it means they have to leave their wife and kids behind at home. And he's saying, you're living in a time when this message of the gospel's Time period on earth is shortening and shortening and shortening. The opportunity for he, people to hear the message of the gospel is getting smaller. The window is closing. And so don't give up. Don't stop. Don't just become the happy guy who's going to stay home in front of the TV and hang out with his wife when there is a war being fought. You need to get out there and share the gospel and face the risk. And we see that as timetables shrink, priorities change. Priorities change as timetables shrink shrink. We see that in conflicts like war. As people realize their time together before deployment shrinks, certain things that used to be so important get moved down the priority list, right? If you find out you're only going to be home for two more days, then you're going to be deployed. Is watering the lawn still number three on the priority list? Is packing for your vacation still number three on the priority list? No. Things move way down, and what becomes crystal clear at the top of the list is spending time with the people I love the most communicating to them the important messages that I want to make sure they have before I leave. Right? Has anyone ever been separated from their family and experienced this? As you notice the time is getting short, the things that used to seem so important just aren't important or as important anymore. For an example, as a dad, for most of my kids' life, a big priority for me with them is like, clean up your room. Pick up the stuff you left in the living room. But for both our girls, as the time with them shrinks and it's, uh, they're getting ready to go to college or whatever and they're not going to be in my house anymore, taking perfect stock of how clean their room is becomes way less important to me. I want to enjoy the week or two weeks or whatever it is we have left. And so other priorities are there. Have I taught you everything you need to know so that you can live a godly life outside of this house? Do you understand that your mom and I love you? Those are the things that become the number one priority. And I care a lot less about how clean the room is or where they left their jacket, or all these things that for most of their life seemed so important, they kind of pale in comparison. And some of you have walked through that with a loved one as you saw their time on earth was coming to an end, and you knew in advance that the time was getting shorter. Didn't your priorities change? And God is telling us, for all of us, the time on earth is shortening. So make sure the priorities are the right ones. Priorities change as timetables shrink. Look at verse 30. There's another example of how things change as timetables shrink. Those who weep as though they did not weep. Those who rejoice as though they did not rejoice. And he writes something similar in 2 Corinthians 6. He says, As sorrowful yet always rejoicing, as poor yet making many rich, as having nothing and yet possessing all things. And what I think he's talking about here, because we're talking about weeping and rejoicing, is emotional reaction. Do you ever have an emotional reaction to circumstances, maybe positive or negative? I do. I see it happen at work. Somebody gets some news they don't like, and then there's yelling on the phone and maybe throwing things if they're particularly upset. We can have big emotional reactions to things we don't like. And when timetables are short, it's important that we don't let those emotional reactions become the focus. For our astronaut guy, if he were a real astronaut, he would have spent some time in the military and spent some time flying planes, most likely. 
And one of the things that I respected as a kid who was super into military aviation and the Blue Angels and fighter pilots, one of the things I really respected about them was listening to the way they communicated. Right? They could be flying this plane that's going 1,000 miles an hour and doing all kinds of crazy stuff, but if you listen to the way they talk to each other, how do they sound? Are they like, oh, we're all going to die! <laughs> I would be concerned if I heard a pilot talking like that. And even if you fly like a commercial airline, and you know, you're going to go fly through some turbulence and all the lights come on, and you know, the, it gets bumpy and things, the pilot's not up there saying, attention everyone, we're all going to die, the left wing's about to fall off, it's pretty scary up here. No. They're calm and under control, and in behaving that way, what do they do for you as the passenger sitting in the back with no control? They give you some confidence that we have a plan about where this thing is going to go. How many of you saw this movie, I think it was called Sully, about the guy who landed the plane on the river? So you can actually listen to the real air traffic control tapes of that whole interaction and what took place. And I've done it a few times because I'm often weird and listen to things other people probably don't care about. But to me, I love to hear those things. How did people respond? And has anyone else done that before I tell you? To me, it's pretty interesting. He is perfectly calm. Okay? The air traffic controller is telling him what heading to turn to and what elevation to be at in order to land on the runway. And he just calmly says on the radio, unable, we're probably going to end up in the Hudson. Just like that. Like, I'm changing my shirt. Right? And the, the air traffic controller continues to offer alternatives. And he's like, well, there's something on my right. Is that Teterboro, Teterboro Airport? And the air traffic controller is calling emergency services to line up him landing at this different airport, make sure the runway is clear. And he's negotiating all this hurriedly, but still calm and in control. And the pilot says, we'll be in the Hudson like five seconds before impact. Because he knows even this closer airport, there's no way they're going to make it. But he's calm and in control as his timetable shrinks. Right? The time that airplane is going to be in the air is getting shorter and shorter. And his options of how to respond to the emergency are getting fewer and fewer. So he executes the option that he knows is most important, which is how do I get these people safely on the ground? And he does it calmly and without emotional freakout. You've experienced, I'm sure all of you have experienced someone in your life who had the emotional freakout at a time when it was not ideal, right? For me, it's most often kids, and you're like in public, and you know, maybe you're at the grocery store, and, and they decide they want a candy bar, right? And you don't have the spare change for a candy bar. It doesn't fit in with your diet for the kid. You don't want them to have the candy bar. But for them, the whole world has come down to, I must have this candy bar. And so nothing's going to be OK until they get their candy bar. And so they're screaming and weeping and gnashing of teeth. And if you're me, that means they're not going to have a candy bar for like a month. <laughs> but to them, the whole world has shrunk down to this candy bar. Adults don't magically grow out of that. And so I see this at work and in church things. We can be fixated on the wrong things. And in fixating on the wrong things, have really adverse emotional freak-out reactions to things that make us ineffective. And so Paul's telling these people, you're going to have difficult circumstances. You're going to run out of food. You're going to be persecuted by the government authorities of the place in which you live. When that happens, even if you're weeping, don't live your life caught up in the weeping. Don't make this emotional outburst the focus of your life. And I've seen the power of listening to this advice in all kinds of crises, right? And I'm sure some of you have too. What if you get on a call? So in my work environment, the big stressful call is when there's an outage. That means something has broken in the network and people who are trying to use their cell phones can't, right? And so by the time someone calls me for something like that, that means all the frontline technical people have been engaged. Nobody's figured it out and people are concerned and stressed, and you know, upper-level management people are mad because things aren't working. And so I get on the call. What if the first thing I did when I get on the call is just freak out and be emotional? <laughs> oh, no, why'd you wake me up? This thing's horrible. <laughs> then I'm going to be up even longer because it's going to take that much longer to fix the problem. And so those conference calls, we call them bridges, when everybody's involved in an outage, you will hear very similar conversations to those air traffic control things. People say only the information that's necessary for the next person to do their thing, and it's calm and slow so that everybody can understand clearly, we repeat ourselves, all that stuff, so that instead of freaking out and accomplishing nothing, we recognize what are the most important tasks to be done, and we execute those tasks. And for these people, there was a great likelihood that they would get fixated on the wrong things. For instance, getting married in the middle of this turmoil becomes the most important thing. So how do you respond to that if you're the guy who wants to get married, and you're in this crisis mode, and you're just not finding Mrs. Wright? It still happens now. There's magazines all about how to deal with this, 
right? Clearly you need to adjust your whole life so you can attract that one girl and nothing else matters anymore. Your character goes out the window, whatever job training you've done goes out the window. My whole life becomes about pursuing this one person. That's the emotional freakout. By the same token, we have people who are going through really legitimate hard crises in their lives and it, in experiencing that crisis, it becomes such the focus of everything they're doing that they can't see the God who's going to sustain them through the crisis, right? You put my husband in jail. I'm done with God. My husband's in jail. My whole life is a tragic pity party. I don't want to hear about anything else. How effective is that going to be for the, is that person going to be for the gospel of Jesus Christ for the remainder of their life? They're not. And it still happens today. Emotional reactions to circumstances should not be the primary focus in life. Emotional reactions to circumstances should not be the primary focus in life. He's not saying don't cry. He's not saying don't be excited and celebrate when the Seahawks win the Super Bowl. He's saying don't let those emotional reactions become the primary focus, the driver of your life. If you choose to live in that emotional freakout zone, you are robbing yourself of effectiveness. And you can see that with pilots, with any job that you work, with your family dynamics, if you're going to be freaked out and emotional all the time, it's very difficult to be effective in whatever it is that you're doing. And as human beings, our primary purpose is to glorify God and enjoy Him forever. Not to be freaked out because things aren't going my way. Not to become so excited because I got that big promotion at work that I'm not paying attention to the things God called me to do, but to live a balanced, healthy life doing what it is that God's called me to do. Okay? The next verse says... They that buy as though they did not possess. Those who buy as though they did not possess. Again, on the surface, that doesn't make a whole lot of sense. So I'm crying, but I'm not supposed to behave as if I'm crying. I'm rejoicing, but I'm not behaving as if I'm rejoicing. And now you're saying I'm going to buy stuff, but not behave as if I own the thing. Does that make any sense at all? So I'm going to go down to the car lot. I'm going to pick out a new car that I really like and then behave as if the car still belongs to somebody else. Why would I do that? I think there's some insight in Isaiah. In Isaiah chapter 24, it says, Behold, the Lord makes the earth empty and makes it waste. He distorts its surface and scatters abroad its inhabitants. And it shall be as with the people, so with the priest. As with the servant, so with his master. As with the maid, so with her mistress. As with the buyer, so with the seller. As with the lender, so with the borrower. As with the creditor, so with the debtor. Do you understand all those little pictures, what we're learning? Your circumstances in life are not going to be the most important thing anymore. When Jesus returns, it doesn't matter whether you're the creditor or the borrower, you're going to have a problem, right? Did you accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? Are you living for him or are you doing your own thing? And it's not going to matter how much money you have. It's not going to matter whether you're someone sitting in the pew or the guy up here talking as the pastor. It's not going to matter whether you're a servant or a master or a maid or a mistress, or the buyer or the seller. Even if you just forked over $40,000 for the new car and you have the new car, it's not going to make a difference. God doesn't accept cars as agents of reconciliation. So your relationship is not going to be fixed because you have a nice house or a nice car or any of these things. And so he's telling us, don't live as if these things that you possess now are what's important in your life. We have a responsibility from God to use whatever resources he's entrusted to our care for his glory, for his kingdom. And for many people, just as we can have emotional freakouts, we can have possession freakouts. So remember the magazine article that I posted up on the screen as we started the message. There were a lot of people in that time period when the stock market crashed who completely lost their minds. My 401k used to have a million dollars in it, and now I only have $400,000. My retirement's broke. What am I going to do? Because their confidence was placed too heavily in their finances. And we can all fall into that trap, right? I often look at my little retirement account at work, right? If I'm between calls sitting there, oh, how are we doing today? And it, it's because there's a little extra measure of comfort, of confidence, of knowing how many dollar bills you have in a bank somewhere, as if that's going to take care of me when everything gets difficult. All my problems can be solved if I just have enough dollar bills to throw at those problems. And it's not true. And so he's saying, don't live your lives in order to acquire things. Even if you buy things, even if you own things, and you have those resources at your disposal, remember they truly belong to God, 
and they're truly used for his purposes, not to give you confidence. Because if the thing is what's giving you confidence, that thing just became an idol. We're supposed to love God with all our hearts, all our souls, all our minds, all our strength. Not new cars, not new houses, not things, but God. And then the last part there, verse 31, says, and those who use this world as not misusing it. Or some of your versions say those who use this world as not abusing it. So there are things that can be abused not by using them with an evil intent, but by using them too much or for more than they were created to be used for. An example is food, right? He's saying if you're using this world and its resources, of which one is food, don't overuse it. Don't misuse it by abuse. And you can see how that happens, right? If I develop an affinity for pizza, maybe that's happened, and I consume too much, eventually my body composition is going to change to reflect that. And it's an unhealthy change. And people might say I've become an abuser of food. Or if I acquire a taste for alcohol, and I drink a glass of wine, and then two glasses of wine, and then a bottle, and then pretty soon I've lost my judgment because I've become someone who abused the alcohol. So each of these things are things that are being abused through overuse. You can abuse this world and its resources through overuse. What does that look like? What does it look like to live in this world where I need air, I need water, I need food to live, but to become such a consumer of it that I've become an abuser of it? It happens when I've invested too heavily in things that are temporary when I place too much confidence in my supply of food, in my supply of water, in my supply of shelter, whatever it is, when I have too much of my confidence in that, and I'm using this thing that God gave me as a tool, as a substitute for the God who gave it to me. We can all make this mistake. I can become more concerned with my food, shelter, clothing than I am with the God who gave me all those things. And Jesus warns us about that in the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew 6. He says, the Gentiles run after all these things, but you guys are going to be different. What are you going to do instead? Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. And so if we're followers of Jesus, the call on us is not to become so attached to these earthly possessions, not to become so heavily invested in these temporary things, but to invest first in his kingdom, to have our highest priority, our greatest attention devoted to his kingdom. Why? Because excess investment in temporary things is a shortcut to wasted lives. Excess investment in temporary things is a shortcut to wasted lives. Paul wants these people to recognize you're living in a narrow time window. Your opportunity is short. So invest in the right things. And this is a principle that applies to us still today. We want to make sure that the the resources we have, the time we have, the life that we have left to live is invested in his kingdom and not just in these temporary, material, physical things. And he gives us the big conclusion as to why all these statements are true at the very last part of that verse. For the form of this world is passing away. For the form of this world is passing away. And we know some of the things that these people were going to encounter. We've already talked about them. The system of worship that they had experienced for a long, long time was going to be completely destroyed when the Romans came and destroyed Jerusalem and leveled the temple. All that stuff that had been their way of life was going to be gone, right? The church was going to be under violent attack from people who rejected God and his authority, people who wanted them to practice idolatry. And so these people who wanted to follow God were going to be living in a condition where that was very, very difficult, and they would be thrown into jail and beaten and had food withheld from them and all these terrible things simply because they wanted to follow Jesus Christ. And he's saying, the world you're used to is passing away. It's not going to last forever. The same thing is true for you today. We live in a world that bases comfort in standard of living, how much money we have, what kind of house we live in, what kind of car we drive. And it's so easy for all of us, even God's kids, to get caught up in that thing. What are the questions we most frequently ask people when we meet them? Oh, what do you do for a living? And I think for most of us, there's a little calculator going on in the back of our mind. Oh, they probably live over here. They probably have these kinds of toys. They make this much money. And this is where they fit in the list of people we know. That's not what we're called to do as followers of God. But that's what we're doing. 
That is the form of the world as we know it. We live in a world that is based on resource. And so we rate people based on how much resource they control, how many things they possess, how much popularity they wield in their culture in which they live, how much influence they have over others. Even within the church, a lot of the books that are being written for people like us as church leaders are things about how we can have more influence over people, how we can become bigger influencers of our community. And as long as that's intended for the glory of God and the influence is for his kingdom, that's great. But if the influence is so I can sell more books or get more people sitting in the pews of a church, that's not necessarily what God called me to do. And so he's saying the form of this world, the world as we know it, is passing away. And it's not just talking about the systems like economic and religious and political, but the world itself is literally passing away. You live on the surface of a planet that is stained by sin. A planet in which there is disease, there is death, there is separation from God, there is crime. There are people, tons and tons of people, living in jail for their rejection of even the human law under which we are supposed to live. The world as you know it is one of decay. And he's saying, recognizing that you live in this world that is passing away, use the one life you have, the resources that God's entrusted your care, to rescue people from this world that is passing away. The world is full of corruption and decay and sin, and God's kids have been called to rush in there and pull people out of the burning building. And we can't rush in there and risk our lives and risk our comfort and risk our wealth and risk our health to pull people out of the fiery building if our primary concern is acquiring a husband or a wife, if our primary concern is having a certain amount of money, if our primary concern is having a certain style of house or car. Our primary concern has to be the kingdom of God or we will lack the motivation to fulfill the one call God has placed on our life, to glorify God and enjoy Him forever. Because we'll be too busy. We'll be too busy getting stuff, too busy finding the next girl or the next guy. And so he says, the form of this world is passing away. Don't invest in these temporary things as your primary reason for living. And that's the last point in your outlines. The world as we know it is a temporary thing. So excessive investment in temporary things is a shortcut to wasted lives. And this world as we know it is a temporary thing. So don't excessively invest in the systems of this world. Invest in God and his kingdom. We're going to close our service today with a song called Grace Alone. It's very fitting for this, our response to this message. Because I cannot, by myself, choose to reject all the trappings of the things this world would offer me. Left to my own devices, I am a selfish jerk. And I'm going to go out there and get all the stuff I can get for me and for my family so that we can live the life I want to live and have the things I want to have. But God does this amazing thing in our lives, in our hearts, so that selfish people like me can have our desires, our wants changed, and we can begin to live for other people. And that's going to happen this week. Many of you are going to give up your pursuit of whatever it is you're pursuing and come serve here for a week so that little kids can hear about the gospel of Jesus Christ. And that's an amazing thing. Many of you who won't be here this week will be doing something similar at other times in your life. You'll be praying for the people who are here. So when everybody else is watching TV and entertaining themselves, you'll be on your knees before a holy God saying, work through the people who are giving up their week to share the gospel of Jesus Christ with little kids. God is doing something in our lives to change our desires, to make us want to serve others, to make us want to rescue people from this world that is passing away. And that thing that is taking place is a work of his grace. He's changing hearts and saving lives. So let's celebrate that together. Thank you for listening. If you'd like to learn more about us, check out our website at www.silverlakebaptist.org.